Good afternoon, everyone. How's everyone doing? My name is Puneet Sharma. I'm the programming manager for the Colonnade Club here at UVA on Pavilion 7. And again, it is so good to see everyone. Thank you for your time and thank you for joining for this special virtual programming that we've been doing during this pandemic. So we are thrilled to have you all. A uh, couple of uh, rules of engagement, uh, like we always do. If you can please make sure you are on mute so the program can flow well. Uh, we would also provide opportunities for everyone to engage. Everyone is familiar with the chat function? Yes, by now. So we'll utilize the chat function uh, for any questions or comments uh, you know, after uh, the program and also during the program, you're more than welcome to send any comments, but we'll make sure we'll take that um, uh, at the dedicated section uh, assigned for discussion. Um, I will continue to let uh, members in. Uh, I'll be facilitating uh, the program, but um, to start off with, uh, let me welcome the Vice President of the Board of Governors of the Colonnade Club, Jerry Seidman, for opening remarks. Jerry. Thank you, Panit. Thank you all for joining us today. Uh, the Colonnade Club started talking about wanting to show this movie about a year ago when we first read about it. I think it was in um, the UVA Today they highlighted it. And we've been talking about trying to get Claudrina on and showing the movie for about a year. So I'm so excited that we are finally able to do this. Um, so with the pandemic, it took us a while to get it together, but it also seemed perfect that we would show it in February. This is Black History Month, and this is um, some great UVA history that we may not have been aware of. So it seemed like February was the perfect month to have this event. Um, I hope some of you um, were able to attend some of the MLK events, either that we put on or that UVA put on, um, but you know, kind of transitioning from MLK remembrances to Black History Month now. Um, so. It seems like a great time to learn about one of the spaces that has made this predominantly white institution feel like a safe place and feel like home to so many UVA students of color over the years. We're excited to share the Black Bus Stop movie with you today. Professor Harold is with us today as well, and I am so thrilled that she could join us. She is the movie's co-director. She's a professor of African American and African Studies in the History Department here at UVA. And her research fake focuses on race-based economic and social injustice. And she's written in numerous books and articles in this area. And she's also um, had a number of films that she's co-directed, most of them with Kevin Everson, who's a history professor in, uh, I'm sorry, who's an art professor at UVA. And the films that Professor Harold and Professor Everson have directed together examine the Black experience either in Charlottesville or at UVA. And the Black Bus Stop is one of those movies that examines the Black experience here at UVA. And so we're lucky to have Professor, Professor Claudrina Harold here with us today to share the Black Bus Stop with you. She's gonna introduce the film and then we're gonna watch it together. And after we watch the film, we'll have some time for um, questions and answers with Professor Harold. So thank everyone, thank you all for joining us and a special thanks to Professor Harold for being here today to share the Black Bus Stop movie with us. So Professor Harold. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. And thanks for having me. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And I'm still saying Happy New Year. So Happy New Year. And also, um, uh, Happy Black History Month. This is um, my favorite month of the year. Um, as a child, I always loved Black History Month, largely because I attended a uh, Catholic school. And if we, whatever prize you won in terms of the Black History contest, you would have one day where you could wear what we call regular clothes. And so I was always passionate about um, uh, Black history. And I'm also passionate increasingly about the history of African Americans at the University of Virginia. Um, since 2011, Kevin Everson and I have been doing these short experimental films on the African American experience at the University of Virginia. And we have attempted to capture, I think, the beauty and the fullness of African-American life at the university. We are interested in exploring those formal and informal spaces where African-American students communed, where they loved each other, where they prayed, 
where they talked politics, where they mobilized, where they fell in love, where they fell out of love <laughs> and moved on. And um, so we've been doing this since 2011 and it emerged in many ways from my own experiences of studying uh, the black experience here. Uh, when I first got here, I taught uh, labor history and also taught the intro to African-American studies. And I was interested in making that story more local. And I just noticed that when I would talk about the local history, when I would talk about the impact that the civil rights movement and the black power movement had on um, the University of Virginia, students just perked up. And so um, slowly but surely with my students, we began to uh, incorporate that into my classes. And so in 2011, there was a call for uh, proposals. Uh, the university, the arts um, ground was interested in bringing arts to the university. And so Kevin and I began to do these short films. And so since 2011, we shot our first film in 2012, actually doing Superstorm Sandy. Uh, in 2012, and that was called Sugar Coated Arsenic. And since then, uh, we've done nine films. Uh, the last day of that shoot, I never forget, Kevin was looking in the viewfinder. I was trying to catch my breath because nothing prepared me really for the physicality of, of filming. And Kevin, who has probably now 200 films, said, okay, Claudrina, what are we going to do next? And so we've done these um, these films on um, African-American student life, African-American intellectual life, uh, and actually, um, I'm, I'm proud to announce they've played at film festivals across the, actually across the world. They've been in Rotterdam. They've been at the London Film Festival. We played at the Whitney Museum as well as the National Gallery of Art. Um, but Criterion Channel is actually featuring five of our films um, this month. And so without any further delay, Black Bus Stop is about Black Bus Stop. In the late 1970s, um, there's no founding date, but African-American students begin to congregate um, near a bus stop, um, and it just became the hangout spot, the spot for people to talk politics, to talk culture, uh, to talk about music, uh, and it really reached its peak in the 1990s. And so when a lot of African-Americans come back to the university, that is actually the spot that they gather. In fact, the um, sorority, the Deltas, actually, they have a... Um, a landmark of their 40th anniversary in that area. Um, and so we decided we wanted to do something on the Black bus stop. And um, by that time, I was teaching a course called Black Fire, uh, which explores this history. And my students do oral interviews. They do um, oral histories. And they interview some folks from the 1980s. And actually, the texture of that interview and what they say, what they say about the black bus stop. They called it the the, the red carpet. Um, that's in the in some of the narrative that you hear very early on. And what we wanted to do was sort of make it also like a magic realism film. So this uh, this film features some of our students, many of our students, and it features members of black Greek fraternities. Uh, and sororities. In 1973, the first Black fraternity arrived on grounds, um, the Qs. And between 1973 and really 1982, a lot of the Black fraternities and sororities uh, appeared on grounds. And so in this film, which is set at the Black bus stop, which is about eight minutes, uh, you will also see the fraternities and sororities um, doing their various dance and their numbers. And we don't have them dressed in their gear or their colors because the idea was for us to make this film and it could be screened in London or it could be screened in Jacksonville, Florida, my hometown or Cleveland, Ohio. And people who are a part of this fraternity, these fraternities and sororities would be able to know the fraternity and sorority. And so uh, it's, it's an experimental film and it's once again about eight minutes and um, I hope you enjoy. On this, it's near. It's more near the Newcomb side than the other side, and part of that was when we were shooting and we were filming. So it's really at the bus stop. Kind of think about more near minor. Um, and so when we're shooting, anytime you're doing film, and and we shoot with live, you know, with with actual film, uh, you also have to sort of get the right, you know, sort of get the right spot. And so it's less. Um, it's less in the exact, you know, sort of spot, but near that near that general area. Um, and um, the idea was to, because there's so much, um, there's so much conversation about that bus stop. And I think sometimes when alums come back and it's, 
if there's not as many people as it used to be when they were there, it becomes this whole conversation about, you know, almost the state of, uh, quote, Black UVA. And so one of the things that we wanted to do, too, was kind of like look at it as, a, as an act of consecration, kind of like reclaiming um, those spaces. And I think once you get to, that was our eighth film. So once you get to your eighth film, now we're at this point, too, where all of the students expect for something to be, uh, to be done. And so um, we wanted to kind of capture that as well. Um, someone said, you know, this is very much intertwined with black fraternities and sororities. Yes. Yeah, so um, it's interesting. Our first film centered on the life of Vivian Verdell Gordon, who was the first um, the chair of the African, well, the second the second chair of the African American Studies Department. And she was here from 1974 to 1980. And so that some ways that film is a celebration of African American studies. Then we have another film that looks at, um, it's called We Demand. It looks at student protests after Kent, the Kent State murders. And then we have a film that focuses on the, on the first four African American athletes who integrated uh, the university, who were also interestingly enough, two of them were charter members uh, of the Kappas. And so it's about, um, capturing, I think, people and institutions um, and providing sort of snapshots, not summative statements, not, um, you know, declarative statements, um, but kind of capturing those, those, kind, those snapshots. And also just capturing also Black student life as lived, um, that it doesn't always have to center around, you know, dealing with white supremacy or racism. And that's not to say none, that is not in some of our films, but also thinking about black students who come here, uh, who came here and who attempted to build institutions and sort of build um, a social and cultural life. I, just, I found it interesting that it was very intertwined with the fraternities and sororities because, you know, historically white fraternities often are rivalries. And so to like claim a space sort of jointly is, would have been unusual, but it was interesting that, you know, the Black Greek life sort of claim, claimed a spot together and there seems oh, to be- Some of this was unusual as well. So, <laughs> I mean, you know, there are those rivalries and, you know, so one of the things that we wanted to do was um, show them doing their own individual thing, but also capture them together. So no, it's still, you have those rivalries uh, in that tradition as well. And so, um, we actually hired Marjani, um, and for any of you who didn't see all of the film or who I know it was stopping, stream is so sometimes difficult, just feel free to email me and I'll, I'll give you a like a private link. Um, but um, we, we hired this choreographer, Marjani Forte, who does like videos and she works with this really noted um, uh, filmmaker, Khalil Joseph, who worked on Beyonce's Lemonade. So we hired her to come in because in my idea, it was just like, okay, just get the students together and let them do their steps. But you have to really kind of choreograph it in a particular kind of way. And so once again, for us, this is about pedagogy. So for Kevin's film class, they got to, to work with a choreographer. They got to see what is it like to sort of produce a film, a short film and use a choreographer. So we actually brought her in in January and uh, we actually um, gave her a chance to meet the students. We, she flew in from LA and then we shot it in April. And this is April of 2018. So it's also interesting, we're shooting this. That, this so this was our first film after um, um, August 11th and 12th. Before we did this film, we also did a film call, um, which is played just at a lot of places as well. It's weird, Black Bus Stop probably has the most legs. Um, it's probably now, it's won about five, you know, film festival awards, but it's probably played at about 30 film festivals. But before we did this, we did a film called um, How Can I Ever Be Late? And it's based on Sly Stone's visit to UVA in 1973. And um, that's an interesting visit because they're like, 20 versions of that visit. And one most recently given to me by uh, my friend George, uh, George Martin, who's a rector here. And um, it's like, you know, first of all, I mean, 
the university, or I should say, um, the folks that brought him, they sued Sly because he was like 45 minutes late. And I'm thinking to myself, I mean, Sly actually came. I would never sue Sly. I mean, if he showed up, that's like great. Um, but it's all of these stories around Sly coming and the Black students going to pick him up from the airport. So that film is like actually just based up based on the airport pickup. Um, but this was, yeah, the film after that. And so, yeah, I know there's some more questions. Thank you, Professor. So Black Bus Stop was on the Monroe side. Is this, um, this is across the street on the minor side? Is that correct? Yeah, we did it on the minor side because that, first of all, we did not have a permit. Um, but we did this on the minor side because in just trying to do the steps and dances, that just gave us a little more space. And also, this is at night and everybody's moving. And so, you know, we didn't have any barriers. So we also just wanted to pick the spot where we thought we could work the best. And like I said, we shoot with real film. And so you, so we set up actually the camera um, in, in the middle of the, you know, in the middle of the street. And so, yeah, as you can see, cause the police come by doing it and it's just, yeah. And does the black bus stop continue on today? Like one of our members were wondering if, uh, if yeah. not, why not? Like, Yeah, I think, um, I think it's, you know, that's a point of contention. It's not as, um, I think it's not as popular as it used to be. And um, I try not to look at that as problematic or to provide too much critique because I think culture changes and culture evolves. Um, in a way, you know, I think people have this similar conversation about the, the gospel choir, Black Voices. Um, at one point that choir had 200 members. It's like 30 now. Um, but in the process, too, there are other organizations that have come and, and gone, you know, you know, um, but it's it's still there. And, and, and in that general vicinity, you'll still see people fl doing flyers and just different things. But it's not what it was, say, in the 1990s. But there is going to um, part of kind of rethinking the landscape. Um, there is going to be a historical marker there. I know that that's coming. I think President Ryan announced that, which is. It's, you know, that's that's also kind of interesting in some ways, and maybe we can talk about that. But, um, um, yeah, it's um, it's not what it, it, you know, it's not what it used to be. But then there are things that are, you know, right now that are more vibrant than they maybe were 10 years ago or 20 years ago. So I try not to look at it as, you know, just a deficit, but to think about in terms of evolution. Like uh, one of our members, Ralph, uh, said, I enjoyed watching the groups practice in the lobby of chemistry building. We, oh, yeah. ne uh, we never got to see the competition, but I wondered what was the origin of this uh, presentation styles by these fraternal and sorority groups. So, yeah, definitely. And so I have a lot of pictures from those practices in chemistry. In fact, on Twitter, on my Twitter feed, I put those pictures up a lot. Um, David Skinner, who was the university's photographer in the 60s and the 70s, he took a lot of those pictures. And it's so rare to find photographers who look for blackness in sort of its casual form and not the sort of iconic shot or struggle or that, that one great person. And so, I mean, the, 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 there's just some amazing, amazing, amazing photography. And I've been... Um, I've been tr I've been sharing that, and so all of our films are are shaped also by photography. Um, you know the photography that we have, um, the photos that we have from the university, but also um, our film "Fastest Man in the State" was shaped by you know photos that uh, the university had that my former colleague Kent Merritt, who was one of those four, but who was a manager in the history department, gave me. But just like also some of, some of the photos from my old basketball days at Temple. So yeah, <laughs> you know, so uh, yeah, that stuff is classic. And just like those memories, and you talking about chemistry, I always listen to to folks talk about those memories. And so even when I even when we're working on one film those memories aren't, aren't far from me. And, and that helps me, um, it helps us shape texture. Thank you so much, Professor Harold. I, I have another one. Uh, I remember uh, Tom Baker said uh, he graduated in 1979 and had a great time in white Greek life. As I've grown older and become more aware of black Greek life, I'm continually amazed and astounded. Greek, Greek life is so much more than college partying in the culture. 
It's about lifelong bonds about every part of life and it has no geographical or institutional bonds. Can you please comment on that special treasure? Oh, sure. It's, it's nothing like it. It's nothing like it. And for some, I divide African-American students into three kind of generations. I call it, there's a trailblazer generation. I say those are the generation that came by the ones and the twos from the 1950s to say 1970. I think there's the institution building generation. And those are the students who came in say 1970 and they began to build these institutions, uh, these fraternities and sororities. And when I talk to a lot of the charter members, that was one of their concerns when they came here. It was like, wow, well, coming to Virginia versus going to Virginia State or Norfolk State, will I be able to continue that fraternal or that sorority tradition that my grandmother had? Will I, will I be a Delta like my grandmother? Will I, be a, will I be a Q like my grandfather or my father? And so um, it's, 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 a, it's a central part of your identity. And these, these folks who are members of these um, fraternities and sororities, they're still close. I mean, I think of Kent Merritt and Harrison Davison. And of course, Harrison Davis was the first African-American quarterback um, at the University of Virginia. He actually was part of the first four to integrate. And he was a, he was a Kappa, as was Kent. And so I think, they, <laughs> I think they talk like every week. And so there's this strong bond, but it's also a beautiful bond that connects you to other people outside of the university it connect so when you heard those students you know talking about their history you can be at the university of virginia but you can be connected to howard university you can be uh at the university of virginia and have some connection to butler or cornell it's an it's an amazing uh it's an amazing thing and i often think about um the civil rights um the freedom summer of 1964 um, when, when people were organizing. And one of the questions that SNCC had for the community, they would say is, what does the dominant or the majority society have that you want? What do they have that you don't want? And what do you have that you want to keep? And so these are also the questions. And th this is the world that also, I think these students were and are negotiating. Thank you. And um, is there a, black bus stop style location today I, and uh, you know i imagine uva is still such a predominantly white institute that there is still a need for safe uh, spaces since the original black bus stop is gone um and you know i don't i don't want to say it's gone i think it's not what it used to be and so if you want to say it's gone in that sense i think there are moments where you can see um, people hanging out in that spot. I think sometimes, you know, uh, you may see students hanging out at the Office of African American Affairs. Um, you may see, I mean, students always pick um, different spots to sort of hang out. It is not what it used to be, but students are often creating and recreating kind of spaces where they form community. I mean, there used to be um, um, also other places on ground where people can congregate. And, you know, I'm really interested to see in a post-COVID world how people make use of kind of the enslaved memorial space. You know, if, if that becomes a space of gathering for all people. I mean, it's, that was one of the things I was really looking forward to seeing um, in the fall. But, you know, that, that, that didn't happen um, because just, you know, social distancing. But we, we will see. Um, but, yeah, there's still they're still kind of spatial realities. Absolutely. And um, yeah, our chat uh, chat is on. If um, any of our members have any, any questions, please um, type in. Or if you feel more comfortable just um, uh, yeah. you know, unmuting yourself, please. Uh, that's fine as well. Absolutely. But you know, go ahead. No, go ahead. I was just going to say I was going to um, ask you about your um, the movies that you said were about the four athletes and I was going to put in a plug in March we are doing a um, book club we're reading the key to the door which is essays by um, the first students who integrated the school of law and medicine and engineering and uh, we picked one chapter that we're going to focus on for discussion but I've read the whole book and each chapter, you know, had something different. To, but I had not heard about the um, four movies of the,
or athletes. So I was wondering if you could give me their names just so I could um, read so, up them a little bit. So yeah, it's uh, Stanley Land, um, linebacker, John Rainey, who's a running back, Harrison Davis, who's a quarterback um, from Bethel, Hampton, Virginia. Um, and um, they signed in late 1969, early 70, and Kent Merritt. Kent Merritt, and that's where we get the title fastest man in the state. He was a native of Charlottesville, was recruited by almost every major university in the country. And so there was a little pressure for him to go to, 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 to sign here. He's, it's, his, his story is fascinating because in some ways he integrated at every level. So he was, um, he integrated, he was a part of kind of not the, the original 12, but he integrated in terms of um, well, Lane High. Um, he attended Jefferson. So it's a very local story. Uh, he was not just an All-American in football in high school. He was also an All-American trackster. Um, and so that's where we get the name Fastest Man in the State. And um, in that film, one of my former students who's, um, I think, was an announcer for the baseball team and the women's basketball team. I don't know if he's still doing it, but uh I, I pulled out a kind of profile of them from the Daily Progress in 1970, and I just had him read it. So he sounds like, you know, Howard Cosell. I don't know. Um, but their, their story is just really, 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 really fascinating. And um, uh, once again, like, this is about just telling stories but learning more. Kit Merritt was Kit Merritt was the department manager in the history department, and I was working on the first film, and I had all of these photos, and sometimes I wouldn't know everybody in the photo, and I'm telling you, it could be like 100 people, and Kit will know everybody by name. And then so we just had this moment where he was like, yeah, Claudrina, um, you know, I did, you know, and so he just, be, I miss him so much. He retired um, last year, and he just was my... We would talk about things. We would talk about the experience of being a student athlete, but he just also knows the history of Charlottesville. So there are like scholars all around this place, you know. So the, the beauty about making film is you just learn to to know that there's a, there's a scholar in everyone, you know. I mean, everyone just knows this history, and so it's just really cool. All right, David. Yeah, you know, can't, they just, I just, so I had to watch it with my students because they go and do oral histories and we've been doing this since 2014 and like everybody interviews <laughs> kids. I was like, you, okay, you got, there's enough, there's enough. But it's also been a way to bring people back into um, the culture and the university. And so it's, um, uh, yeah, and if my name's Quadrina Harrell, CNH6G, if you just send me an email, um, I'll just send you a, a private link and just don't, you know, put it out there because this stuff is still like on the festival circuit. But actually five of the films have just been, um, they're playing in the, on the Criterion channel for Black History Month. So um, the Criterion channel selected Black Fire as, 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 a, as, a, as, a, as a set of films that they wanted to play. And so, um, yeah, um, that's, um, my next film project is called Pride. We just finished shooting it. And so, um, I'm looking at the the um, the, the chat. Uh, Pride was a magazine or a, a newspaper that Black students started in 1975, um, and it continued kind of into the 90s. And then the internet came along, and Facebook, and you know, I think the students said, "Oh, we're going to just do a digital issue," and I think they did one, and it just stopped. And so um, I have been. Um, so we decided to just like do this snapshot of Pride in the 90s. And I guess last year was a year of Pride because in my Black Fire class, our students decided to sort of um, to re, you know, to revitalize Pride. So I'm just show you. I know this is not show and tell, but I'm so proud of my students. So we did like these Pride magazines. It just was going to be web stuff, but I got them and, you know, I was just amazed by their graphic design. So I just, you know, got some research money and just printed out like 50 different, 50 copies. There's about 200 students in the course. And so we do a group project at the end where I have them work in <laughs> groups of 15 and 20. Everybody tells me that's bad pedagogy, but it's the only way a group project would work with that many students. And so, yeah, it's um, awesome. I think uh, Professor Harold, someone, uh, one of our members had asked how long it took uh, to, uh, you know, make the film on, on this uh, location. Yeah, so it took us, we did three days. So we, we shot the, um, the student group that you see sort of doing the day 
just talking. We shot that like on a Wednesday. That probably took like maybe an hour and a half, two hours. To be honest with you, the hardest thing is just setting up the equipment. And then the actual um, <laughs> the actual stepping and all of that probably took two hours because that's all the time that the students gave us because they had a step show that night. And so the step show for them was much more important than anything that we were asking them to do. And so um, we, and then the next day, uh, one group came in for another hour. So if people want to be a part of the project, we always try to make that happen. But normally our, our films happen over a three day period. And usually the actors, the people in front are kind of students from my class. So they're learning this history too. So they, they have a commitment to like show up. And it's about their organization. So it works with kind of the self-centered nature of <laughs> those students. And then Kevin's students who are in his advanced or cinematography or even beginning cinematography, they're behind the, the, the camera. So they work on with the props or they work with, um, you know, an electronic department. So it's like also teaching them how to make a film. So we had one student, um, Michelle, who worked on with this on this film. Um, last year, she had a film in Sundance. So, you know, she's like, you know, so it, a lot of this is just about teaching for us, too. Absolutely. Is there a recommended website? I know a um, few of our members wanted to see if there is a website you recommend where other films that you have done, they can kind of view. Um, what I'll do is, and I just, I'm just sending my email to everyone just in case I don't get your email and just email me and I'll just send them all to you on Vimeo. And there's just a private link that you need and just, you know, don't share it. But um, just s send me your email and I'll just send you all of the, the links to the films. Absolutely. One of uh, the comments came through that they really enjoyed the film. Thank you for sharing it. Also right. wanted to thank you for bringing your Black Fire class to UVA. Um, like, uh, you know, member's son was in your class in his four fourth year and it had a great impact on him. So thank you. Oh, thank you. No, it's, it's been, um, it's my, um, I love teaching it. And I'll just say um, a couple of years ago, I was being recruited by another school that I won't name. And they were like, can you bring Black Fire to, um, <laughs> to, to us? And I just said, one, I would never try to learn the institutional history of a place that I have to work at every day again in life. I just, it, no. But also there's something kind of distinctive about UVA's history and the experience. And so it's just been a, um, it's been a pleasure to just dive deep into this history. And it's a pleasure to, um, I'm teaching the course Black Fire now, and it's a pleasure to to share these stories with my students, to get them to know someone like a Kent Merritt or a James Roebuck, who's a, a, a representative, but who was the first African-American student council president, uh, and to get them to know of someone like a Clarence Kane, um, who was actually inspired the film Philadelphia. Um, that film actually was based on this lawsuit of someone who was, of course, unfairly dismissed because they had, um, they had AIDS. Um, and a lot of people, some people know, but some people don't know. Uh, this story is based on two people. And one of those people, Clarence Kane, is a graduate of UVA. And uh, he was also a Sigma. So it, 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 it pleases me to see the Sigmas, for example, a fraternity. And this gets to this question of the important work that fraternities do. Um, every, every year they have a, a special event called Know Your Status. Um, and so even if you walk across the lawn and, and now the students on their door of the lawn, they've taken to putting the names of, you know, people who lived in that, on that, in, in that, um, in that lawn room. And a lot of times you will see them reference some of the folks that they encounter um, just in this larger history. And so for me, you know, I think there's sometimes conversations about what are we going to get rid of? And, you know, that's fine. But I, I also want to illuminate those people who just did some amazing things that I think we should know. And not just people, generations, groups. I think it's very important that it just is not this singular um, kind of one man history, but that, that we talk about generations, uh, uh, groups of people who build things. Um, I definitely don't think that I would be here and had the experience that I have without some of these people that are illuminated in my work. And so... You know, yeah, I'm happy about Black history. <laughs> I'm happy about, you know, being here and, and being able to do it. It's just enriched my life considerably, or at least my intellectual life or, you know, my UVA life 
So, yeah. Professor Harold, do you know do you know where the students are from the movie? You mean the ones who acted in it? Yeah. Yeah, they're around. I mean, so I think now they all have graduated. Um, but you know, I still talk to them all the time. If when we play, like we play when we played at the New York Film Festival, um, you know, we give them tickets. If they're in that area, we try to get them to come. So most of my students, I'm pretty much still. I mean, that's the thing from two from most of these films, they have been my students. So I'm still like pretty much in contact with them and. Um, you know, they're doing a lot of amazing stuff, you know, so. Um, yeah. And then, you know, there's a comment in, in the key to the door, it sounded like the first black students at UVA found their safe spaces in the Charlottesville community rather than on grounds. Mm -hmm. What would you, what's your take on that? I mean, I think that it, I think that is true to a certain extent. I mean, that's how Kent talks about it. So he was a native of Charlottesville. So he talks about, um, you know, how when things got tough and rough. And I, I mean, I think we should think about like a Harrison Davis. Just imagine being a black quarterback in 1970, 71, 72, 73. Um, I mean, I can remember, you know, like being growing, kind of growing up, I was born in 76, but just like in the 80s, that's still being, you know, kind of a big deal. And there were some things that he went through just in the ACC when he would travel, you know, going to Death Valley, going to, um, you know, going to Atlanta, going to these, going to Blacksburg. And so he talked about his experiences. And so he found refuge in, you know, the kitchen of Kent's mother, you know, I mean, like, so the Charlottesville community was important. I think as the numbers increased and there emerged what we might call a critical mass, I think people were able to find, um, you know, a safe space on grounds, but there's still this connection to the community. And I think a connection that kind of emerges out of to the African-American experience and how black education developed. You know, when you think about historically black colleges, it was about, yeah, you get your education, but what you're gonna do for your community? What's your relationship to your community? What's your responsibility? I mean, when you come from a situation, when you think about enslavement and you think about literacy was a crime, that means that you, literacy takes on a deeper and a different meaning. And it's almost a collective thing. So education, you know, so there was this driving sense of not just socializing, but that there needed to be some connection to the community. And I think through organ, I think a lot of times through the fraternities and sororities, we, you know, we kind of, we see that as well, but I think not the, to the extent that is um, articulated in the, in the very important book, The Key to the Door. You know, I think, um, I think it changes over time. And then I think, you know, it just depends. And overall, you agree we have came a long way uh, when the black bus stop existed. You've you've seen considerable progress made, right? I didn't say that. No, <laughs> um, I think pro I think there's progress and there's regress. I think it's very um. I think it's very um. I think it's um very complex. But I do like the question of would it be considered progress when the BBS existed. You know, I think some people frame those kind of things as self-segregation rather than thinking about how do you maintain a yeah. But I think what I like about, I love about that question of progress when the BBS existed, I think it's, I think it's very okay. important and it's powerful when you come into a space and you feel maybe comfortable enough or uncomfortable enough to, to sort of create your own thing. You know, so it's like, it would be like me going into a department meeting um, and, and you know, I have to be me as well. You know, I have to be Claudrine at the end of the day. And so I think um, it's, 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 it's sacred to me. The black bus stop is sacred. And I'll, you know, I know we're winding up and I'll end on this. Um, and just, I probably, sh I'm sharing more than I should, but in the summer, um, when there were all these conversations about the monument, and you know how on, in Richmond, they projected images on the Robert E. Lee monument. And so there were some conversations about doing something in Charlottesville and they wanted to like project some images. And one of the images that they wanted to project was like the image of this film. 
And Kevin and I had this conversation and trust me, we have a lot of interesting conversations about the use of our work. And we were just like, that's not what this film is about. And so I think what's been interesting for us in a moment of where everybody's tracing and digging up the past, but sometimes we all are digging up different pasts and doing it for different reasons. And so for us, it's trying to also move and groove within that context, but I just didn't feel comfortable with that. Well, Professor Harold, um, this has been a very knowledgeable session. Okay. I'll personally like to thank you on behalf of uh, Colonnade Club for your time um, as we continue to celebrate, um, you know, it's just the beginning of Black History Month. Um, I also encourage other members to partake in uh, various events that are organized throughout UVA and nationwide as well. And, um, you know, we look forward to welcoming you sometime at the club and, you know, hopefully uh, once uh, in-person interactions uh, are allowed again. But um, I, I just wanted to thank you uh, especially for uh, being here with us to share your knowledge and insights.